So in just over one month, there will be a total solar eclipse in the United States and in Mexico. And of course, I will be there. And in this video, I'm going to talk about what I am planning, what my contingent contingency planning is, how I am planning to watch the eclipse, how I am planning to photograph perhaps the eclipse and all of the tools that I'm using to make those decisions. And I'll share all of that with you so you can learn from what I'm doing. And also you can leave comments to let you know about particular trick tips and tricks that you may have. So we can have a nice and fat discussion in the comments about how to best view and photograph this eclipse. Oh, and I'm Quiv, the lazy geek. Welcome to the channel. If you like this video, click like, subscribe and leave a comment. Oh, and also this video is sponsored by bullion.org more later in the video. But first, let me talk about my plans for the eclipse and how I came, came to those plans with my way of thinking and what tools I used to make those plans. So I'm living in Japan. So I'm on the like literally the opposite side of the world because yes, the planet is a globe and it is not flat. And I will be going to Dallas Fort Worth uh, by plane a few days before the eclipse. The reasoning for that is very simple. There are direct flights between Tokyo and Dallas Fort Worth. There were some relatively cheap tickets from American Airlines. Dallas Fort Worth is on the path of the totality. And I also hear it's a great area to be in in general. So what's not to like there? And several days in advance because I want to make sure I am fresh and I don't have any jet lag left when the eclipse actually happens. And by the way, a lot of that, ex that experience comes from uh, my presence at the last total solar eclipse in the United States, which was in August 2017. Because yes, I was there, Gandalf. I was there 3000 years ago and Isildur took the ring. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was there. It was it was awesome. And I want to apply my experience to this trip as well. So first, one of the very important things to realize is that uh, in a total solar eclipse, there is either you are in the totality of the eclipse, so you are in the complete shadow of the moon with the moon passing in front of the sun and completely obscuring the sun for a given amount of time, or you are outside of the eclipse. Even if the moon obscures 99% obscures of the sun, the difference between that 99% and 100% of the total eclipse is literally night and day. You absolutely need to and want to and have to go ahead and drive or travel or whatever you want to go to the area of totality of the eclipse. The experience is going to be completely, entirely and 100% different. So how do you figure out where is the path of the eclipse? And within that path, which is the best place to go to? Well, I use multiple criteria and I'm currently sharing my screen with uh, a map here that's been created by uh, a Frenchman called Xavier. Thank you, Xavier. And uh, we have here the path of the eclipse across uh, North America from Mexico to the uh, United States. And I think a slight bit of Canada as well. Nice. Canada does have it as well. And to make things, I'll put all of the links, of course, down in the description. And to make things simple, basically between those two reddish lines, you have the total eclipse. Outside of them, you have partial eclipse. Pretty much nothing. I mean, partial eclipse are fun as well. But they're like so completely different than the total eclipse. You really want to be in between those uh, red lines. And another very important thing to realize is that depending on how centered you are between those two red lines, then the length of the eclipse will change. If you are in the middle, then the eclipse will be the longest, like the totality, the, the length of time during which the sun is completely obscured by the moon will be the longest in the middle of that band. And if you're on the edge of the ba band, like very close to the edge, the totality will be just a few seconds long versus something like four minutes at the center. So if you want to enjoy the totality of the eclipse for the longest time poss possible, you will want to head towards the center line of that band of totality. And on this map, you can click on any point to get more details. So if I go to uh, Sulphur Springs, and uh, let's say I'm uh, I'm on the lake of uh, Lake Sulphur. I'm on the uh, I'm at the airport. Let's say here I'm at the airport. I can click there, and you can see we have the start of the partial eclipse, which will be in universal time, 
at 5 p.m. So it's actually going to be much earlier in local time. Um, so it starts the start of the total eclipse. So the totality, the moon completely obscuring the sun is going to be at uh, 1843 roughly. And then the end is going to be at 1847 and 20 seconds. So for a duration of the totality of around four minutes and 20 seconds, which is completely amazing. And then the end of the uh, partial eclipse will be to a couple of hours, like one and a half hours later, uh, where the moon is no longer shadowing or obscuring the sun at all. So this tool is super useful to be able to check, okay, where should I be going? And what is the compromise of going there? Because let's take Another example, you're looking at the path of totality and let's say you, li you live in Durant, whatever, and uh, you're thinking like, hey, I can just go uh, there because I don't know why, but why not? I want to go there and you want to see what's there. You click there and you can see the start of the solar eclipse will be at 6.44, 15 seconds. And the end of the total eclipse will be at six, at 644 and 51 seconds. So not even 40 seconds of totality. So you can see we have a big difference in the band, even within the totality. So two lessons there. You absolutely want to be in the band of totality. And the more centered you are in that band of totality, the longer the totality of the eclipse will last. And if we zoom out, we're going to see why. So I'm, I'm zooming out and you can see that if I click anywhere, I can see like the shadow of the sun kind of appears there. So the start of the partial eclipse, you can see, um, sorry, the, the start. So the start of the total eclipse, you can see as I have my mouse hovering there, you can see the circled shadow there, the edge of it starts touching your position. And then the maximum of the eclipse is when you are at the center of that, that, that shadow area of the, uh, of the moon. And the end of the total eclipse is when that circle, that shadow circle has moved past you and you are now at the outer edge of it again. So we can see exactly why we're getting those timings. And obviously, if you're on towards the edge of that band, then the, the distance, the distance between the edges of that circle are closer, right? You, you'll hit those edges faster than otherwise. So that is where this is coming from. Okay, so now that's a factor. You know you want to be on that band of the total eclipse and you, want, you know you want to be uh, there at the right time because the time at which the eclipse occurs will depend on the location that you are at. And you can check the time via this map here. Again, all links down in the description. But also you want to know what is the high, what, where are the places with the highest likelihoods of good weather because obviously if it's going to be fully cloudy the total eclipse will not be that much fun so for that i used a different website which is this one eclipsophil there and it has several maps this is a super interesting website so i really uh suggest you read it in its entirety but there are some charts there that are very interesting in particular this one which gives you the median cloud fraction for april across the united states and mexico with bluer numbers or lower numbers being better, basically fewer clouds. And this one, which gives you the, uh, <laughs> the average April cloud amount along the central line of the total solar eclipse. So if I look at them individually, this chart tells us like a Dallas on average has 55% cloud coverage at the center line of the eclipse in April. That's pretty high. And then if we go to like, uh, well, Quebec, <laughs> then we're at like 85%. That's really bad. We're getting really not very good. So, but using that chart, we can see very easily that the more south you are, the better, uh, or the more likely you are to have no clouds or as little cloud cover as possible for the eclipse. So for me, Dallas is there. So it makes a lot of sense. Although you can see that even going to Oklahoma doesn't seem to change much of anything, maybe a slight increase. Arkansas is fine as well. Uh, Missouri is, is fine as well. But when you go to Illinois, things starts to get a bit spicy, right? So Illinois would be kind of like my limits. I would try to go further south by default. And then, of course, if you want to really put all chances on your side, you want to go to Mexico, where in the best places in Mexico, you have like on average 20% 
obviously. This is all statistics. It does not guarantee anything, but it is about putting the most chances on your side. So what did I decide to do for my part? Well, I personally decided not to be directly in Dallas during the eclipse. I am going to be in Oklahoma. And there's some very good reasons why I've decided to be in Oklahoma. There's a mystery reason that I will reveal later in this video, so make sure to stay tuned. But some other reasons are very practical. One, I expect there to be less traffic in Oklahoma compared to Texas especially around the area of Dallas-Fort Worth and between Dallas and Austin. Because one of my feelings has been that the last eclipse in the United States in 2017, people didn't seem to care that much. I mean, I was there and people didn't care. Like the day before the eclipse, I saw that where I was, which was Charleston, South Carolina, the weather forecast was not great. So I traveled to Greenville, South Carolina as well. And I was able to take the day before a super cheap Airbnb. And when I traveled, there was, there was no traffic at all going to Greenville and back as well. It was absolutely crazy. And I, I think people just didn't pay attention. But now they've learned the lesson and they are interested in the solar eclipse. So I get the feeling we want to be a bit more ready about traffic. Okay, so that's one advantage of Oklahoma. Besides that, I want to be able to stretch my legs depending on the weather forecast from the day before. I'll, I will be lo looking at the forecast very closely and being in Oklahoma will give me the uh, option to go either further south or further north because even if the north statistically has more chance of being cloudy, there's nothing that tells me that maybe it will be cloudy all over Texas, but for whatever reason, it's going to be sunny north of Arkansas. What? Who knows, right? So I wanted to find like a decent middle point that lets me stretch my legs in either direction of the band of totality without having to go to another country. Because if you've decided that you want to be within the United States for the eclipse and you start in Austin or in San Antonio, your range of travel is more limited if the weather forecast doesn't look good. So that's my logic about where I will be ready to watch the eclipse, but also ready to move. Those are my contingency plans. The weather forecast the day before, a car, and just run to wherever the forecast is the best. Now, with all of the stuff we've been looking at, like the shadow of the moon, the, the, the moon completely covering the sun, all of that stuff, I find that fascinating. And I wanted to learn more about the mechanics of that. So gravitational mechanics and orbital mechanics, which are super interesting topics. And if you want to learn more about them, like I did, or you want to learn more about math, science, physics, or computer science in general, the best way to do that is to use brilliant.org. Brilliant is a sponsor that I'm really happy to have because it's an app that I use pretty much every day and it helps me really learn a lot of different topics at my leisure, at my pace. And all of the lessons that are in there, they're usually very clear, very easy to understand and super interactive. So I get an intuitive grasp of all of the concepts before we go deeper in the lessons. Also, those lessons, they're like bite-sized, they're quite short. So in my busy schedule between being a full-time employee and a YouTuber, and my other hobbies, whenever I have some downtime, I love to just like open a brilliant, solve a couple of problems, learn about something, and it's absolutely fascinating. And just as I mentioned, there is a gravitational mechanics course on Brilliant that I've recently been taking. It's a lot of fun and I highly recommend it. Plus, it's really apropos for the times with the eclipse coming up. And of course, gravitational mechanics is only a small sample of what's available on Brilliant. There's tons of other courses available to learn about a variety of topics, including super in-depth with an easy to follow progression curve. And new lessons keep being added every month. So there's never a way to get bored. So if that sounds interesting to you and you too want to try out uh, Brilliant, for free for a full month, you should go to brilliant.org slash quivlazygeek. The links are also in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, now we've learned about gravitational mechanics. So let's go to the equipment that you want to have with you for the eclipse. So to watch the eclipse, I highly recommend 
such glasses as those ones, right? You never want to use tools that are, you know, that you built yourself, like a, a smoked piece of glass or sunglasses uh, put one after the other. Those are terrible methods. You don't want to use an ND filter for a camera to protect your eyes because you can still have eye damage. You really want those like Myler type of uh, glasses that are specific to the eclipse and specific for solar observation. And you do not want to, to look at the sun directly anytime. One of the things with looking at the sun directly is that are through like improper protection. So things that is not this is that eye damage is painless most of the time. So you wouldn't even know you have eye damage until you realize it later. So I cannot stress that enough. Take care of your eyes. Do not look at the sun through your naked eyes or through non-approved filters, only use filters like this. Even beforehand, you want to make maybe make sure quickly that there are no leaks like small pinholes in your glasses just to be extra sure. And you only have one pair of eyes, you really want to take care of it. And one of the things as well, uh, it's absolutely possible to take your phone and take pictures with your phone through that gla th those sunglasses, as long as you don't look at the sun directly. Uh, what I've seen do is basically you take pictures with your phone and your eyes are in the shadow of your phone. So you have maybe one eye closed or covered by some uh, something to uh, to basically not let light to your eye. And your, your other eye is in the shadow of the sun and it's taking picture through the glasses. Now, if you make a mistake, you could stare at the sun directly. So I don't necessarily recommend this, but it is possible if you are very careful. If you're using a telescope, uh, or binoculars to look at the sun. Well, you very often, you very often have access to filters like that, sometimes mounted in a cell that will fit your specific telescope. This is fitting my 150 millimeters Newtonian telescope that I have for astrophotography. And it is also made of mylar and it fits the front aperture of the telescope. Generally, especially if you're using a reflecting type of telescope, you never want to use a solar filter that is only at the end to, next to your eye because the glass in those filters, sometimes they're sold even though they're very old, can crack. And then if you're watching while it cracks, goodbye your eye, seriously. So be very, very careful. I would always recommend um, to have like the solar filter at the aperture of the, the telescope, except if it is something recent made by a decent company that you know is safe to use, such as the Daystar Quark Chromosphere product, which is an excellent way to look at the sun in H alpha. So you have, you can see all of the prominences of the sun, those like basically eruptions of fire on the, the edge of the sun and all of the filaments on the surface of the sun using this kind of filter that is actually for small refractors at the next to your eyepiece, right in front of your eyepiece. But that is actually safe because it's been built to do that. So this is what I'm talking about, like this kind of thing that you put towards the end of your telescope. If your telescope is a small refractor that is air spaced lenses, that's most small refractors, and it has a focal ratio of F7 or slower, so F7 or higher effectively, then you can use that and you do need to power it via a micro USB and via a USB power bank. But these are, while they are expensive, they're excellent bang for the buck. So if you already have a small refractor that is maybe like, I think these days it's supposed to be 100 millimeters aperture or less, and its focal ratio is roughly F7 or slower, then you should really consider this. I had a quark chromosphere for the eclipse back in 2017. I since sold it because I'm an idiot, but it was amazing. I compared it against dedicated solar telescopes that were far more expensive and the quark chromosphere was just better. Although I hear there's a lot of equipment lottery when you buy this quark, but still you have a guaranteed uh, band pass for it. It's, uh, it's an amazing investment. I'll put the links down in the description. And that's if you want to observe the sun in H alpha, you can use that before the eclipse as well and always be entertained. You can also take photos through this using a planetary camera or even a DSLR with an adapter. It's extremely versatile. 
And the same can be said of other types of dedicated solar telescopes like the Mead Corradano 40mm PSD for personal solar telescope, which is also quite popular, or the uh, Lund Solar 50mm 50, 50 H-alpha solar telescope with pressure tuner. tuner. Uh, those are also relatively budget options because they also give you the H alpha band pass of the sun to give you really true image of the suns with the prominences. It's amazing if you've never uh, looked through a solar scope, it's, it's great investments. If you are hesitating between uh, the three, my preference would normally be for the Daystar Quark if you have the underlying refractor to use it with, then the Lunt Solar Telescope, and then the Coronado PST, personal preference. There's also a small telescope that I've heard a lot about and I've always been very interested in, which apparently contains the, the Quark Chromosphere eyepiece or something very similar to it, called the Daystar Solar Scout 60 millimeters. I've always wanted to buy it, never pulled the trigger, and it's currently out of stock everywhere I can find. So unfortunately, I cannot recommend it for the solar eclipse because it's not available. All of those uh, telescopes there that I showed and accessories, they can also be used to image the sun throughout the eclipse. And of course, you can also look for those solar glasses that I mentioned earlier. And you can also buy solar film, just the film. So basically just like the, uh, the, the shiny film that is on this, uh, on this filter and cut it to size yourself to fit it to like a pair of binoculars or to fill it, fit it to your own telescope. As long as you're very careful in how you build it, you make sure there are no light leaks from the sun that could uh, cause you harm, then you absolutely can use that and it's a lot of fun. And even on Amazon, you have tons of filters that are available, including for your cameras. However, if you see something like an ND filter, it should be at least ND 100,000, as you see here. Sometimes it's called OD5, so I think that's what this is, for instance. And typically, you want to use that only with your camera. You do not want to look through those filters with the naked eye. This is really for camera use only. So you need to be absolutely super careful with all of that but I'll put all of the, those links in the description so you can have a look. Now, to give you an idea, this is how I was looking at the eclipse the last time in 2017 with uh, my wife looking up with binoculars. I had created filters for both objectives of the binoculars using solar film, just like I showed earlier. I also had like a Vixen telescope here with the quark chromosphere available. And I was using my own glasses to look at the sun as we were getting closer and closer to totality. This was in Greenville, uh, South Carolina, and it was absolutely amazing. For this particular eclipse, though, my equipment will be slightly different. I am planning to go with my Seastar S50 telescope from ZW. So this is a smart telescope with GoTo integrated. It is small, it is relatively light, it is easy to carry with me, and it comes with a solar filter that you can just pop in. Uh, I have a video of that, including uh, some quick solar imaging, if you want to have a look, because you can use that to actually take photos every five minutes or even take short videos every five minutes that you can then process into single images later on. So in my review of that, I have a passage with that, so you may want to have a look. I'll put the link down below, and if you remember, also up above. And I will, of course, also be bringing those solar glasses, because why not? So what do you think of my choice of equipment for this particular eclipse? Let me know down in the comments. While you're going there, please like the video, subscribe, in which case, welcome to the channel. You can click that bell icon to also see any follow-up videos I may have about my trip to the US for the eclipse. And if you're feeling particularly grandiosely generous, you can join my Patreon, link down in the description. My, some of my Patreons get access to my uh, videos at free and in advance or you can join the channel as a member. Everyone gets their credit also at the end of uh, videos longer than 20 minutes. And it truly helped makes the channel possible. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon supporters and channel members, like it's uh, amazing support. Okay, but now that I've gotten that behind me, what about photography? What is my advice in terms of how to photograph the solar eclipse? I already gave a couple of ideas using the Seastar S50 will let you photograph the eclipse. And during totality, you can actually remove the solar filter as long as you place it back before the totality ends. So give yourself like maybe 30 seconds after totality has started, you can take pictures without the solar filter. And then 30 seconds before totality is planned to end, 
you place back the filter just to be on the safe side. And in between, you can take like a long video, you can take a series of short videos, or you can take single photos. That works great. And you can do exactly the same thing with a DSLR that you bought a proper ND filter with, a proper solar filter with, or that you made your own solar filter using solar filter film, as I have in the links down in the description. But to be honest, my recommendation, and actually maybe not my recommendation, but my personal preference, and this is what I've done in the last Eclipse as well, is to not record it. And this is just my own personal philosophy. I love astrophotography when it comes to like deep sky objects, stuff that I can take any time when I want and I know they're not changing. They're always waiting for me. An eclipse is an event. An event needs to be experienced to the fullest. And if I have camera equipment that can fail and that can get me frustrated, I don't like that. I do not want to be frustrated during this eclipse. I do not want to take any pictures during the eclipse. I might take some pictures with the sea star, but I will not stress if I don't manage to take those pictures. Honestly, from my experience with the last eclipse, the experience was incredible. And I can't imagine like having been busy taking pictures because it's the small details that are incredible. You get into totality. You look 360 degrees around you, it's dusk. It's incredible. You listen. The insects are suddenly changed. The, the, the cries from those insects, they're different insects that are singing or whatever the correct word is. Even, like, even the smell of the air was somehow different. The temperature dropped. And something that I felt through me, it was a magical experience. And I'm not sure I would have felt that experience with if I had like, been taking pictures like crazy. So like sometime at the middle of the totality remembered like, oh yeah, we might want to take a couple of pictures just for posterity. And this is what we ended up with, right? A selfie <laughs> with the, still the sun obscured, looks bright like a, like a full moon, right? So it, it almost looks like we're just taking this picture it, during a full moon. It has no scientific or artistic value whatsoever, but it has so much value to me personally to my wife and to my cousin who's also in the picture. And it, it means more than like those super well done shots of the eclipse. Because I know, I trust you guys, I trust everyone to take super cool pictures of the eclipse. And because I trust you to do that, I'll just experience and enjoy the eclipse with, without distraction. Or will I? Because yeah, I might do something a bit counterproductive this time. Because if you uh, have followed the channel for a long time, you may know that one of my hobbies besides astrophotography is paragliding. Paragliding is an insane lot of fun. And it so happens that uh, we found a paragliding site that is within the band of totality. <laughs> so we're kind of sort of thinking of like being flying our paragliders while admiring the eclipse once it becomes total. Uh, it's a silly plan. It's a crazy plan. I don't know if it makes a lot of sense. I'll definitely be distracted, but it's definitely a unique way to experience the eclipse. And because I've already experienced like the, the full totality with no distraction the last time uh, in 2017, I'm thinking, hey, why not? So that's kind of my plan, which means I absolutely will not have time to do any image taking of the eclipse, although I will try to record my flight if I am indeed able to fly. So yeah, that's where Crazy Quiv, uh, the not so lazy geek maybe, comes into play. What are your thoughts on all of this? What are your tips and tricks for the eclipse? Where will you be observing from? Will you be there for the eclipse? Do you have suggestions, etc.? I think we really want to have a conversation down in the comments. I, 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 let's enrich each other with information and I'm looking forward to it. If you have other tools as well to prepare to the eclipse or you know some really good weather sites that we should be looking at in particular prior to the, like the day before the eclipse to know exactly where we should be watching the eclipse from, also let us know down in the comments. And if you disagree with any part of this video, let us know as well. It's all super important as knowledge sharing for this amazing event. But really, this is all I had for today. Uh, obviously, this is a long video, so I will have a list of credits with my Patreons and channel members without whom this channel would not be possible. Thank you so much, guys. 
Uh, but more important than that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars or at the eclipsed sun. And if the sun is not fully eclipsed, use proper eye protection to view the sun. But with that, I'll see you next time.